good to be here. If you came in a little bit late, my name is Ryan, and uh, I'm the lead pastor here at Curtis Lake, and I'm excited to have you here today because it's really boring if nobody else is in the room. It's just me. feels kind of pointless, <laughs> but that's all right. So uh, we're in a series called Identity Theft, and we're kind of asking this question of what does it mean to put on Jesus, right? Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, which is our anchor verse, if you're new here, uh, all of our kind of talks on Sunday mornings are generally tied together in groups of like four to six weeks, and there's a verse that I just, a verse out of a, a letter that's found in the Bible, or a verse out of a book in the Bible, I just encourage everybody to read it a couple times a day, put it in their phone, tattoo it on their body, something like that, to just remind them of it. I wouldn't tattoo it on your neck, because you can't, you can't read it then, you know, but uh, somewhere where you can see, just read it a couple times, get it in your heart. Galatians 3.27 says, all who have been united with Christ in, what's the word? <laughs> Baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes, right? And so we're talking about what does it mean as people who follow Jesus to put on Christ like new clothes, like actually steal the identity of Jesus. This is what we're supposed to do. And what does it mean for those of you who are in this space and you're considering what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to go to church? What does it mean to be a person of faith? Who is God? Who is Jesus? It's important that you answer the question, well, if I'm supposed to look like this Jesus, I should understand who he is. And, and the way we're doing that is we're looking at some statements that Jesus Jesus made when he says, I am, and then he says a couple of things in this one gospel of John that's a book found in the Bible. And so each week we're taking one of Jesus's I am statements and saying, okay, if I'm trying to understand Jesus, what are the implications of that I am statement? And if I'm trying to follow Jesus, what are the implications of that I am statement? All right. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, before we jump in though, let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever in your life been afraid of the dark? Raise your hand up nice and high. You've been afraid. How many of you have never been afraid of the dark? You laugh at the darkness. Anybody in this room want to lie in church? Go ahead, right? Man, I, I, I literally kind of grew up in churches. My dad was a pastor. I actually lived in a church one time, in, like right before I got married, lived inside of this creepy old church. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and churches are funny. They, they're a great source of hope, and the buildings can be wonderful places of community. But I'm going to tell you what, you remove all the people and shut off all the lights, the only thing left are the demons. <laughs> I mean, that's it. Like, the angels aren't here, God isn't present, two or three are gathered, there I am. You take two or three out, and you're in trouble in a church. Like, that's... that's true story, right? And so I'm a kid, right? And, 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 and I was always like, when you're a kid, the church doesn't have to be big to be big. You know what I mean? Like I remember as a kid, like going down this hill in a backyard and you think it's this huge monstrous thing and you're Tarzan and it's great. And then you go back and visit it when you're full grown and you're like, what the heck was that? That was nothing. You know, it's like a little step. So like, but I did grow up, like most of the churches we were a part of were like big places. And I'd inevitably end up on like one side of the church and my parents would be on the other side of the church, all the lights are off. And churches are in closed buildings a lot of times internally, so there's no windows or anything. It could be bright as could be outside, but you can be in a church room that is like pitch black. And I can remember like as a kid, just like walking through the church and like everything's fine. And then like your brain starts working overload, you know, over time. And then it's like you start walking faster and faster and faster because it's just darker and darker and darker to the point where I'm like sprinting across like this church because... I know that Beelzebub is in the house, right? And I, like, Legion is somewhere in the room. I'm not sure what's going on. And the last thing I want to do is be throwing myself in the fire naked, right? So I'm just doing everything I can to get out of this church, right? Because it's dark. Darkness settles in on us, right? And when we think about darkness, right, at its, at its very core, darkness is what? It's nothing but the lack of something. If you're a talk notes person, I just gave you the first fill-in. It's yellow, bold, underlined, right? Darkness is simply the lack of something, metaphorically and physically. Darkness is the lack of light, right? When, when a room is dark, it simply means that there is an absence of light. Like if we were to shut off all the lights, black out everything, be pitch black in this room, what are we missing? Well, we still have pews, we still have people, right? We still have one another, we could cuddle up, and, but the reality is we're missing light. If you've ever heard the phrase like, oh, those were dark times, right? There's a dark time in my life. It was a time where I lacked hope, like dark time in my finances, right? We could talk about having a dark mind. Oftentimes that means like there's a lack of clarity, right? Man, that got dark quick, right? There's this lack of clarity around where I'm going, what I'm doing. We can have a dark marriage, right? There's a darkness to our marriage. There's a lack of understanding, right? And darkness is fascinating because we really can't understand it until we've experienced light. Right? If you kind of grew up in a world that was dark, that there was no light, you wouldn't have a word. It would just be what it is. It's like a fish in water. Fish doesn't understand water, right? Until it's not there, I suppose. But at the end of the day, like when you're surrounded by it, it just is. 
And darkness is like that. It's understood in the context of light. So we understand like a darkness in our relationship. We understand a darkness in our finances. We understand a darkness in our parenting. We understand a darkness in our own hearts because we've experienced light at some point in time in those areas. Or we've seen what we perceive as light. And here's how darkness works. I, I think darkness, metaphorically speaking, darkness depends on deception. See, darkness is a deceiver. And in its deception, it produces these varying degrees of death in areas of our lives, right? So it deceives us, right? And it deceives us with fear, with insecurity, with hopelessness, and it produces a measure of death. So we, have, we find death in our marriages. We find death in our relationship with our children. We find death in our friendships. We find death in our work environment, right? In the dark places that we start to feel fear, and it really does produce insecurity in our lives, right? That's a big deal with darkness. Darkness wants you to move to a place of insecurity, right? Why? Because darkness deceives us that either something is there when it's not, or that something is not there when it is. Like, that's what darkness does. So my wife is out of town with our daughter, uh, Wendy and Micah. They're, they're out in Mexico. So Judah and I, our 15-year-old son, we're home kind of by ourselves surviving, right? Literally just surviving. I always tell Wendy, like, she goes and she's like, well, you need to make sure this, this, this. I'm like, babe, like, we're a partnership here. This is not going to happen while you're gone. Like, I, I can't do it. Like, I've just accepted you are too important to this equation that when you leave, life does not go on as usual around here, you know? I said, don't sell yourself short, <laughs> right? And so we're just, like, making it through, surviving, whatever. But I don't sleep well when Wendy's gone, right? There's just something different about that. And some of you have experienced this in your life, you know, at times or seasons. You may be gone through a divorce. It's just, there's this awkwardness when you're used to companionship in the presence of someone. So I just don't sleep well. I'll sleep light. And so I'm, I'm in bed the other night and, and all of a sudden I wake up in the middle of the night and I like shoot up in bed and I am confident that there's something in the room. Right? Roman's asleep, not doing anything. I'm just confident. So I'm just like immediately under the covers, like too bad Judah. It was great knowing you for 15 years. You're on your own, you know. <laughs> was there anything in the room? No. But the darkness deceived me. The darkness oftentimes does deceive you too that there is nothing there when there is something there. And your foot tells you this when you wake up at night and you go to the bathroom. The darkness told you that the nightstand wasn't there, but your foot is like, no, no, it was there. Right? The darkness told you that the door was open and your face told you, no, <laughs> that door was shut. Right? So that's what darkness does. It deceives us in, in very powerful ways, right? Physically speaking, painful ways, but also emotionally and spiritually. Because ultimately, emotionally and spiritually, darkness does a great job of hiding the good that actually exists. So what darkness wants to do is hide the good that exists in these spaces of our life and produce a measure of insecurity so we, we kind of, we, 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 gentle, we don't jump all the way in. We're feeling, you know, we're doing that walk through the dark, like, I know there's something out here. And so what darkness does is it comes and it clouds our perception to be able to see the good. And this kind of idea of darkness and light, these are terms that have been used in cultures all over the world from the beginning of time to express this massive disparity between what is good and beautiful and what is not. And, and in Jesus' world, in his context, in John chapter 8, verse 12, he stands up in front of the crowd and he says, I am the light of the world. That's a bold statement in Jewish thought. Because in Judaism, in ancient Judaism, now Jesus was a Jew, right? So anytime we hear the words of Jesus, we really have to suspend the way we understand those words. And we have to ask the question, well, how would Jesus, a first century Jew, have understood those words. And that was only about 2,000 years ago. So it should be pretty easy for us to do that. No. <laughs> That's a difficult thing to do. It'd be like, and I said this last week, and I try to say this often, it'd be like us trying to write something down and, and expect that somebody in the year 4,020 would be able to understand it, right? This is what makes the Bible so inspired, is that 2,000 years later, it still is speaking and shaping us. So what does Jesus mean when he says light of the world? And more importantly, what would his Jewish audience have thought, right? So for the Jewish mind, light was the symbol of all that was good and beautiful in this world. That anything good, anything beautiful was the product of light. The Jewish Midrash, which is a commentary on kind of the, the Torah, 
which was written after Jesus, but it, its ideas go back deep into the time of Jesus. The Jewish Midrash, there's a discussion that's happening, and it says this, from what was light created, right? Because the, the, the Jewish understanding was that light was the first creation, right? God said, let there be, now, you don't have to be a church person, you got that one. Nice job, everybody, right? Let there be light, and there was light. And it separated the day from the night. Like, so, first, so the question is like, from what was light created? And the answer is whispered, God cloaked himself in a white shawl and the light of its splendor shone from one end of the world to the other. Like in the Jewish mindset, in the Jewish imagination, light did not belong to this world. The light itself emanated from the creator. The light flooded this world because of the essence of the creator that was good and beautiful. Right? It was in all things, and so it took on this role that the light that we experience in the world was actually the fullness of God around us, illuminating the good things. So the psalmist writes in Psalm 31, 16, the favor of God, what's the word? Shines, the language of light, it shines on us. Psalm 80, verse 17 says, the face of God shines on us. Psalm 118, verse 7 says, God himself shines on us. Job 25, 5, which is a good one, says God shines brighter than the moon, and he shines brighter than the stars, which tells us right there that the Bible is not a very good science book because the moon doesn't shine. So everybody relax. <laughs> see, God was brighter than these stars, these things that they could see with their eyes. And so the light that permeated, it illuminated what the darkness would hide. That's what light did. The goodness of God poured forth into this world and illuminates all that is good. And it's a wonderful metaphor for God, and it became such a strong metaphor in the Jewish mind because do you see light? No. You only actually see what light reveals. Right? We, don't walk, we walk into the space and we see what light reveals, but we don't actually see light. We experience light. It's the same with God. We experience God all around us, present in everything, illuminating the goodness in this world. And when light pierces in, it illuminates what was once in the darkness. And this is, a, again, a huge part of the Jewish understanding of light, that light would shine forth on the wickedness, and it would expose the deeds of wickedness. It would expose the deeds of darkness. So Psalm 94 and Psalm 36 talks about justice shining. And when justice shines, it illuminates what? Injustice. Right? When, we, when, when behavior and actions that are righteous, that are, that are of God, they reveal God, right? They also illuminate what is not of God, the injustice. Isaiah 62, 1 says, righteousness shines, illuminating unrighteousness. Right? Those righteous acts. So Jesus comes in and he says, guess what? I'm the light of the world. Like, that's a big statement. And then he goes on and he says, if you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Let's talk about a couple of words here that Jesus uses. First, he uses the word follow me. If you will follow me. One thing you got to know about Curtis Lake, our church, our understanding, and the way you'll hear me say this is that Jesus's invitation is always an invitation to follow. Follow. Now, it, is belief part of that? Absolutely. But you'll rarely hear me talk about, you just need to believe in Jesus, right? You'll rarely hear me talk about this language of invite Jesus into your heart. Those are, those are wonderful, like, images that help us, but they fall short of the actual call of the person of Jesus to follow him, to take up your cross daily, to walk in his way. That's what the call is. And so Jesus says, if you will follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because Jesus doesn't walk in the darkness. So you've got to follow him. He's the light of the world. He illuminates the path, right? And he says, if you follow me, you'll have light. This light that shows all that is good. This light that can illuminate the things that, that would deceive us into thinking this will produce good in our lives. And he says, and it's the light that leads to, right, this path that leads to life. Now, I know for you Mainers, this is a really weird concept to light up a pathway. <laughs> For some dumb reason, y'all don't like street lights. I, I can't figure out why not, but you have a moral opposition to it, right? So this is a weird imagery I get from many of you, but right? there are actually a lot of roads throughout the continental United States that have these things called street lights on it. 
right? And they kind of illuminate the path so you don't have to turn your turn signal on 55,000 times wondering if that's, oh no, that's not the street, oh no, that's not the street, oh no, that's not the street, right? St street lights solve that problem. Save a blinker, put in a street light, right? <laughs> Jesus said, man, I'm going to light up the path that leads to life. Now, Jesus doesn't use the word eternal life here. He just uses the word life because for Jesus, when he talks about life, right, the one that he gives is a fullness of life that includes this concept of eternity, but it's not about an eternity that starts when your breath stops. It's about life right here, right now, what it means to be light in this world, to find the path that produces hope and joy and forgiveness and grace and mercy and love and conviction and wonderful things in our lives right here and right now. And so this light is a light that makes the way accessible, a way of goodness, a way of beauty. That's, that's what's so powerful about Jesus, right? Like, like Jesus wasn't saying, like, there's only one little uh, way. Like, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and nothing else. Like, he was saying, no, all these things you've been told, right, that have clouded the way of life, like, that's not it. I am it. And I'm accessible, you see, what, what had clouded and what had produced darkness in, in Jesus' hearers when he said this were things like religious oppression, political oppression, poverty, violence. And I know for most of us, these are such foreign concepts we've never experienced. <laughs> like, we don't live in a world like this. Yeah, we do, all right? Like, we live in a world where, re where, where a religion oppresses. We live in a world where there's political oppression, political depression too, but political oppression, right? We live in a world where there is poverty and violence, and these are forms of darkness, and they hide this clear path of peace and joy. Violence, aggression, they hide this path, and Jesus comes along and says, hey, if you want to follow me, I'll light up the pathway that leads to real life. So the point that Jesus is getting at when he says, I am the light of the world, is that I will illuminate the good that darkness tries to hide. Come and follow me. Come and follow me. Because this is a dark world where darkness is constantly trying to hide what is there. This goodness that God has for you, this peace that God has for you. And the darkness is trying to deceive you into things that aren't there, that God is against you, that God wants nothing but just your, you know, he just wants your money, he just wants your obedience, he just wants you to bow the knee, whether it hurts or not, like he will get you to bow. And Jesus says, hold, hold on, like I can produce a light that can show the good path. And so this series, we've been talking a lot about baptism, where baptism fits into this. Because my agenda is to encourage baptism. Like if you're in here and you're exploring this person of Jesus and what it means to follow him, baptism is a crucial part of that because baptism is this kind of first outward act of obedience that says, okay, I, I was on my path and now I'm on Jesus' path. And so baptism is this moment where we kind of die to our old way of thinking and walk into this new life in Christ. And so baptism is kind of like the light switch. Right? How many of you have ever been in the dark? You know there's a stupid light switch on your wall, but you can't find it. <laughs> Like, you're just like constantly, like, where is that thing? It's over here somewhere, you know? And then you finally, what, you feel it, and you're like, oh, there's the light switch. What happens in your heart when you feel like, oh, finally, and you flip that light on, and it's like, why, right? That's like what baptism is, right? Baptism is this spiritual light switch that it's like, I know in my heart and my life that, that God has more for me. I know that there's more to this world. I know that, the, that there's darkness in my life. And baptism is a moment where we found the switch, this way of Jesus, and we flip that switch. And some of you can think right now, and you know it's true, like your heart's leaping because you remember the moment where you were baptized, and you remember when you came out of that water, and you felt that moment, you felt that reality. Because see, baptism is not about you found the switch, you turned it on, you met the class, blah, 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 blah. Baptism is about you recognizing that God installed the light switch. God is the source of light. God brought me to the switch. God gave me the fingers to flip the switch, not to flip people off, but to flip the light switch. You know, it's this recognition of what God has done in our lives. So I want to encourage you. If you've never been baptized and you've made this decision that you want to follow Jesus, do it. Get baptized. Experience what God has for you. There's something so powerful about this public profession. Now, what are the implications for those of us in the room who are trying to follow Jesus? Well, here's the thing. Like, Jesus talks about his church, right, to, to Peter. And it's this, this word, this idea of the called out ones, the ones that the Father has given to him, the ones that are following him. 
And so when Jesus leaves this earth, when he left this earth, he's like, okay, you're it. Like, you're the body of Christ. And this language started to appear in the early church that, that the church was the body of Christ here in this world present. And so whatever Jesus was, I have a deep conviction that his individual followers and his collective gathered experiences like local churches that we're called to be. So when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, guess what? As a follower of Jesus, part of the body of Christ, I am now the light of the world. Our gathered experience is to be the light of the world. So what does that mean? So here's the invitation today. The invitation from God is what I would say is to be a mercy candle. Be a mercy candle. Be a mercy candle. So how many of you have some candles at home? You have candles at home, right? Okay, so I brought a candle with me. I, I want to encourage you to be a three wick candle. Have you ever seen a candle like that? It's got three wicks in it. You know what this is? This is a way to sell more candles. <laughs> Truth be told, because if they only put one wick in it, it would last three times as long. You do know that, right? So somebody was like, let's put five wicks in it, and we'll call it a five-wick candle. It'd be really cool, and then people have to buy a candle five times more, right? And we do it. We're like, yeah, light it up. Okay, but here's what I want you to do. That's just free of charge, right? So we have these three-wick candles, right? And and I want to encourage you to be a candle, first of all. Like, I don't believe that God wants us to be the high beams, okay? Like, how many of y'all love having high beams sh just in your face when you're driving down the road, right? Not most of us, right? We're like, turn it off, right? And that's the way most people experience followers of Jesus, especially the evangelical type in our world today. Like, turn it off, right? <laughs> It's just too bright. It's too hot. Like, so yesterday I'm going to Walmart to buy this candle because I really, I think, ahead on this stuff, right? And so I'm, I'm, I'm going there to buy this candle. So I get dressed, I get, I get a shower, and I, I put on a sweatshirt that I have. And the sweatshirt that I have is, it says, on the front it says, Common Good Christians. And I think I've worn it here before. And I really, I love the Common Good Christians kind of movement. It's kind of one of the few political things that I think is actually worth kind of looking at. Um, so I'm putting it on, and then like there's this side of me, like I looked in the mirror, and I was like, what am I doing? I'm going to Walmart in a shirt that has the word Christian on it. I like, took it off immediately, right? I mean, I was like, there is no chance I am wearing this shirt, right, to go out to Walmart. I'll wear that to church, but I'm not wearing that to Walmart. And now for some of you, you're like, what is wrong with our pastor, right? Like, why am I going to church here? Because here's the deal, right? Like, I am ashamed to be called Christian in our world. I'm absolutely ashamed of it. Because I know what the word has become. Now, I'm not ashamed to follow Jesus in his way. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But the word Christian has taken on so many meanings and contexts that it's just like, it's so bright. And, and it has hurt so many that I really don't want to go out and without any kind of a conversation, just have this shirt on that says Christian on it. And then people make their assumptions about what I am based upon some knucklehead that they met at work that, that doesn't represent the Jesus I know. You know what I mean? And so I think there's this reality of like, I can be this like, I have, to, I have to measure myself and recognize that I would rather go to Walmart and not wear a sweatshirt that says Christian and look for opportunities to help people in Walmart. I mean, first of all, I'd rather not go to Walmart ever, but if the Lord takes me there, right? I'm there, like I wanna look for how I can help somebody because I'm tall and I can reach the shelf, right? I wanna look for somebody who something falls and I can go over and help them out. I wanna look for somebody who looks like they might be struggling and I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I've got a little money and I can actually help maybe pay for their groceries. Like, see, I'd rather do that than wear some stupid sweatshirt that's gonna offend somebody every day of the week. And I think that's the difference, like between being a candle and being a blowtorch. I had to temper my words there. <laughs> <laughs> Because what I wanted to say, you really shouldn't say anywhere, let alone in church. Okay, so <laughs> here's, here's, the, here's the scoop. Psalm 112, verse 4. Throw that verse up there for me. Psalm 112, verse 4 is where I got this three-wick uh, idea. It says, light shines in the darkness for the godly. What that means is where the godly go, light shines in the darkness. That's what Jesus is saying. I'll light up the path. Follow me. And they are, here's the three words that Psalm says, generous. That's the first wick. How do I light this thing? Okay, that's the first wick. They are generous. They are what? Compassionate. That's the second wick. And they are, what's the word? Righteous. righteous. Oh, man, church people love that word. I knew you'd get that one right. <laughs> righteous. Okay. Oh, Jesus, help us. We're out of time. Okay. <laughs> they should be starting the slow music right now, and I should be praying. I just want you to know that. Okay. So very quickly, what does this mean? The first wick of generosity. Be generous with our time, talent, and treasure. Warm. 
right? We look for those opportunities to give ourselves. We all have a measure of time, we all have a measure of talent, and we all have a measure of wealth. So how are we being generous? How are we looking for opportunities? Isaiah 58, 10 says this, feed the hungry and help those in trouble. That's generosity. Using of my time, talents, and treasure to help those who need it. Generosity. Then, what does it say? Your light will shine out from the darkness, and the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. See, I don't know any other way to be light than to, act, to take action, right? So we, we, we live generously. Second one is compassionate. What is compassion? Thoughtful, kind-hearted, an empathetic disposition. See, compassion is oftentimes mixed up with pity. See, compassion moves us. Pity makes us feel sorry for someone. Like, I can pity a person because, oh, they dug that hole. Look at how miserable their life is. I feel bad for them, but hey, it's their fault. But see, here's the thing. Compassion will illuminate the trauma behind the behavior that we find so appalling. And as followers of Jesus, people who bear this moniker Christian, we are really good at finding behavior appalling. But Jesus was always moved with compassion. Like, he saw the trauma in people's lives behind that behavior, which moved him to a place of mercy. That's what compassion is. Like, pity just looks at the behavior. It's like, oh my gosh, they're just going to continue to ruin their life. That's just too bad. But compassion looks beyond that behavior. It says, here's the trauma that is informing that behavior. And so I can now have compassion because I recognize that this person who might be victimizing has in some ways been a victim. And it changes our perception. And then nowhere in that did I compromise my own ethics or morality or belief of right or wrong. But it shapes the way I interact. And then this word righteous, the righteous wick. And this is, we love this one. Love it. Here's the thing, though. When God talks about righteousness, the Hebrew mind understanding of it, it is not religious piety. I mean, there were religiously pious people who were anything but righteous. This is why Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, sorry. And these were the most religiously pious people. I mean, they made all the rules, didn't break any of them. But see, r- righteousness in God's economy is not departing from the way of God, from that lit path of God. And so what is that lit path? What is the righteous way of Jesus now, the full revelation? The righteous way of Jesus is love of enemy, not love of going to church. I mean, let's face it. When, you're, when, when I look this good and am this funny, who wouldn't love to go to church? A lot of people be honest but see jesus doesn't call us to love going to church jesus doesn't call us to this religious piety he calls us to a love of enemy to going the extra mile for people to caring for the least of these and see when we actually then live in that path when we have this little light that shines all of a sudden we shine light on something that is so foreign to so many people in our world and that is kindness when we become the light of the world we become kindness we show kindness we illuminate kindness and kindness is powerful it's the kindness of the lord that brings people to repentance mark twain said that kindness is a language that the deaf can hear and the blind can see it's kindness it's so powerful and i got this feeling that if we were to interview 20 people who weren't following jesus and we were to ask them Tell me the first word that comes to mind when you think of Christian. I'm going to guess kindness isn't the word that most people think about. In fact, I don't have to guess. The research, the research has been done. It's not. But that's, it's interesting. That is the call. That is the way of Jesus. Love of enemy. This like unmeasured kindness that caused people into a place of repentance. And you know how when we walk around, I said earlier, when we walk around, darkness produces insecurity. Right? We're not sure where it is. Where's the door? Where's the cat? Where's the dog? Right? Where's the food bowl? Oh, there it is. Now my feet are all wet. Whatever it might be, right? Darkness produces insecurity. You walk slow. You're not sure. Everything is measured. But here's the thing. When you find the light of Jesus, when you walk in the light of Jesus, you find security. You find a path and a way that produces this deep sense of security that gives you a boldness to walk boldly into the very throne room of God. You find this boldness for life, for joy, to be bold in your kindness, bold in your grace. Because Jesus said this, we're going to talk about it next week as we look at Jesus' statement about I am the shepherd. Jesus said this, he, said, he was talking about how the father and, sh- and the sheep know his voice and the sheep are the ones that the Lord and the father has given to him. He says, no one can snatch them away from me, for my father has given them to me and he is more powerful 
than anyone else. And that light produces security in our lives that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God, neither height nor depth, nothing. And so we don't have to walk with light, but we can walk with light and we can be light. And the darkest places only need just a little bit of light to illuminate. See, in this room, like I can be in your face about the light because there's so much light already here and we need to be challenged. But when I go out into my world and my space and I recognize that there's so much brokenness and pain and light, like I don't, I want to bring this warmth, this light in so that eyes and pupils can adjust and the journey can begin for people to have darkness illuminated. And here's the thing, I want that in my life too because I've got a lot of dark spaces and I need people to come with the warmth of the light of the world and illuminate the good space in there and help me understand and see it. What I don't need are high beams shining in my face from four feet away. I do not need that. Nobody needs that. Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you for today and um, thank you that you are the light of the world, that all goodness and all beauty that is represented in here emanates from you, God. And thank you for this imagery and this language and Help us, Father, to uh, recognize and look at our lives if we're following you. Like, do we have high beams on and are we actually pushing people away versus inviting people into the goodness of God to allow your kindness to produce repentance over time, over a season? Help us not to walk in insecurity, God, and fear, and hopelessness, but help us to walk in this light this path that is illuminated before us by your son, Jesus, who is the light of the world. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May you see and know that you are the light of the world. May you be a three-wick candle bringing compassion into the hearts and lives of people, being generous and walking in the way of Jesus, this path of sacrifice and love for enemies and service to the poor and care for the least of these, and love for neighbor. And I pray that your light would shine in such a way that it would be so warm that your house would be filled with people experiencing the joy of Jesus through you. That your kitchen table would be filled with family and friends who love to be in your presence because they feel that they are in the presence of Jesus. Amen.